Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. Dale and I are particularly excited today to be joined by Dr. James Eglinton, whose recent biography, Bovink, a critical biography, uh, lighted up both of our worlds. Speaking a, a bit personally for the moment, this was an especially exciting read for me. Uh, I wrote a review of the book for, for Davenant's Ad Fontes magazine, and, and there I mentioned my own discovery of Bob Inc. at the as an undergraduate at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. I remember perusing the stacks and found the, the first volume of the recently published Dogmatics, and just a glance at the table of contents revealed to me that I had found a crucial conversation partner. It was in seminary, though, at Reformed Theological Seminary in D.C., uh, that I was finally able to work through the dogmatics with the, the late Dr. Howard Griffith, who used them in our systematics courses. And it was a sort of mini conversion experience of the mind and soul for me. Bovink spoke in ways that others did not. And I remember feeling that I had to know and understand this man, what made him who he was. And so I waited and waited for a good biography. And at last one has arrived. Uh, James, brother, yeah, you already know how I feel about this book, but uh, seriously, everybody, uh, let me just start by saying that Bovink proves himself from the grave to be one of the key guides through modernity in the Christian church. Mm. I hope he is translated in every language because I think his work quite literally has ecumenical and civilizational significance. And I think James's biography is key in showing us how and why this is so. So, so James, thanks for being here today. And I hope we can get more people excited to read Herman Bovink and crucially to learn to read him well in order to see all that he's up to. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a really generous and kind welcome. It's, it's a delight to talk with you guys. I listen to um, Pilgrim Faith pretty regularly. So it's really ah. just a, a pleasure for me to come and connect with you both and to talk with you. So. Oh, it's a, it's a oh, wonderful. That's a, that's a good endorsement uh, 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 that you watch uh, uh, feels good. <laughs> yes, I, I remember when uh, uh, Joe, Joe sent me a message one night, I don't know, around like 9.30 p.m. or something. He said, Dr. Eglinton is listening to one of our podcasts. Can you believe yes, that? Can you believe like... we arrived? <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. right. You guys uh, need to have higher aspirations for the kind of people who listen to your <laughs> podcast. But, but I do love it. And I, I think you... You know, you both ask such um, insightful questions and have such edifying discussions. So um, oh. I really do enjoy your podcast. Oh, thank you. That's very encouraging. Um, maybe as a way of just getting into the biography, uh, for, for, for people who maybe this is, uh, they've heard about Bob Inc. It's, you know, he's been sort of floating mm -hmm. around in the background. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how this book relates to your previous work? Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Dr. Eglinton's previous work is this Trinity and Organism on the organic motif in Bovink. Um, so, so maybe one way of putting the two together would be to ask, can you tell us, uh, you know, in Bovink interpretation, there's this sort of two Bovinks hypothesis mm. and how your earlier work addressed that hypothesis. And then maybe how does your biography continue in a mm. way to address that hypothesis? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Uh, so the first book, Trinity and Organism was based on my doctoral thesis, which I finished in 2010 here at the University of Edinburgh. When I started my PhD, uh, it was on Bavinck, but I didn't really know what I was going to write about exactly. So I had the figure and I was just looking for the, the idea and the topic. And um, I spent a lot of first year reading primary sources and without really having a specific agenda, I was just letting Bavinck sink in and um, just trying to f get to know his thoughts, try to find ways of thinking and uh, maybe things that looked particularly interesting or that hadn't been touched on. And something that struck me as I read through his works was how often he would talk in organicist language. Uh, so this organic kind of metaphor that comes up uh, and plays a really significant role across his corpus um, from really early on and is actually a, a lifelong kind of commitment or just an idea that he returns to over and over and over. Um, so then I I started to notice this a lot in the primary sources, and then that then sent me looking to secondary sources to find, has anyone else written on this? Because, you know, you can't really just rehash someone else's thesis. You have to have something original to say. And um, uh, so then in the secondary sources, I found that there was some work on Bavinck's organicism. Um, but then that really led me into um, a kind of way of reading Bavinck that I then ended up trying to overturn in that book. So 
what I discovered was that, and this was again fairly early, you know, first year PhD students, um, that I discovered that for quite a while in the 20th century, people had, a number of Bavink scholars had read him, assuming that he fundamentally had a very divided mind in terms of how his orthodox Calvinism related to the modern world. And people would write about how there were two Herman Bavinks rather than one, and that he just could never decide which of those um, poles had a stronger gravitational pull on him. So um, I obviously spent a lot of time in that first year reading secondary literature on Bavink as well, and found that this actually functioned as a way of interpreting his works, a kind of hermeneutic. That mm. um, you know, if you if you know much about Bavink, you you know, that he writes all of this great dogmatic theology um, and it's very much steeped in the historic Orthodox reform tradition. But then he also is so concerned about modern sciences and modern culture and psychology and modern poetry and um, all of these other very modern concerns. So this assumption that really we're talking about two Bavinks or almost two halves of his brain that just aren't connected and that each of their moments of controlling him, um, th th that should influence how we read his works, uh, where we talk about this particular paragraph where he's expounding Calvin approvingly and we say, well, that's the work of the orthodox Bavink. But then we mm -hmm. get a few pages on and he's praising the discoveries of modern geology. And that's the orthodox Bavink. And um, and we find even in the secondary literature, people who talk about him as schizophrenic theologically or as mm -hmm. a Jekyll and Hyde kind of figure. Um, so I just kept on reading throughout that first year and then uh, start, it really started to crystallize in my own mind that I didn't think this was the right way to read him and that I, that what he was doing with the idea of being orthodox in the modern world was much more sophisticated than that and that he actually had a, a way of thinking primarily about God but then about the world that God has made that equipped him to, to think in categories that emphasize diverse things that somehow hold together uh, even things that might mm. not hold together very easily but you should try and hold them together and uh, lo and behold uh, you can see a pattern where and how he writes where this is where he relies on the metaphor of the organism the organism being one thing made up of lots of diverse parts that do their that fulfill their own roles but with a common goal um, so they're all pushing mm -hmm. together for one thing for the life of the organism so um, my first book was was all about that idea and that's why it's called trinity and organism it's this idea that um, he has particular ways of thinking about god about the doctrine of the trinity that then shape how he views the world and um, it was really a, an effort to push how we read bavink away from the two bavinks um, model mm. which i thought was very fruitless and um, really limited the worthwhile kind of discussions that i thought were waiting in Bavink sources, but that we never really got to because he had two, I guess, camps of readers who were mm. annexing his thoughts. And so he would say, you know, you know, this section really belongs to me because I'm in the Orthodox camp. And I'd, I kind of ignore the other stuff, the modern Bavink's writings. Yeah. And you had the, and you had vice versa as well. And the, the more um, modern group of Bavink readers who liked some parts of his work, but didn't really face up to the other half of the work that they didn't like as much or didn't gravitate mm. to. Um, so the first book tried to reject all of that and uh, and develop some kind of a new reading of Bavink where I was asserting that his theological vision is really united. Um, mm. And then the, the I mean the, the book ended with a, a call um, that we need to rethink all of Bavink studies actually and what we write about him from now on has to begin through a, a different starting point which is one single Herman Bavink an orthodox yeah. Calvinist who's also trying to be a modern person. So the mm. book, uh, I mean, I, I look back on it now and think it sounded a bit grandiose, but it called for sequels. It called for people mm. to yeah. pick this up and do something with it and revisit his sources and also revisit his life. Um, so I then went away thinking, you know, if I were to write that sequel and answer my own call, what would it be? Um, and then that turned into a biography. So the first book is Bavink's Theology, but then the second book is The Theologian and trying to tell the story of a life that produces someone who has a grand intellectual project um, of living before the face of God in a holistic way, equipped by the resources of the Catholic Christian faith, a faith for all of life, also for all of life in the modern age. Uh, how does a 
one particular historical actor inherit that kind of a vision um, because it's quite an unusual one in his own social context mm. and it has such huge consequences for even the country around him for the netherlands uh, which is yes. uh, undergoing all kinds of social transformation so how does what kind of person leads that kind of a life um, and not just in theory but also in practice in so many ways because he had this fascinating uh, well in the book i call him a polymath so a polymathic mm. kind of existence yeah. where he does so many different things in life as well but seems to have a way of holding this all together conceptually and also practically as well so yes. that's the background to the current book and, and the first book yeah one of the things that i was uh <clears throat> well and the book is just so thoroughly researched um because you're you're also this is offering a corrective like we talked about with this dubovic thesis and i think that the uh you know research that you document in the book is um, just so thorough that it's going to be hard for anybody who picks your book up and wants to be critical of your criticisms to sort of punch holes in your academic work. Um, but, you know, you just said there, uh, you're showing Bovink the theologian, and I very much appreciate that. Um, I haven't read through his entire systematics, I've sort of, or his dogmatics, I've used them as, you know, in preparing sermons or writing papers or things like that. Um, and Joe and I are finishing up reading uh, Christian Worldview right now. And uh, it does seem that the theologian is just his attitude and approach to the world is a noble um, sort of attitude and approach to adopt like an ethos almost that Bob Inc. had. And this is one thing Joe and I have been talking about as well is that in your book, you, you constantly mentioned the ground that's shifting underneath of his feet. He's like trying to understand the world and the context and the culture is shifting around him. You got liberalism and you got the sciences and, and he's trying to maintain his orthodoxy and make sense of the world. Yeah. And that, I think a lot of us feel that way right now in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and especially for reformed people, they're having to deal with genetic sequencing and mapping and, and the human mm. genome project and how do we answer these ethical questions? How do we deal with this stuff? And there's a, there's one camp that sort of just, you know, clutches their pearls and hunkers down and, and you know, screams mm. as loud as they can. Well, the confession says. Uh, and then there's another, there's another camp that's like, huh, how do I actually approach this thing in a holistic way, in a wise way to navigate modernity? And I think Joe said in his uh, review of the book in uh, Davenant um, that, what did you say? You said Bovink was the first theologian to really speak to us, the modern man. Yeah, the, the, what the biography did for me is, <clears throat> excuse me, it was just surprising how relevant his life was. You know, the kinds of tensions he's navigating in his particular confessional community. Obviously, there there there's different nuances, but the kind mm -hmm. of the kind of battle between the the sort of maybe well-meaning but very very super cautious sort of confessionalist who is just nervous about modern learning kind of in principle mm. uh, but then also on the other side those you know those people really could look at other ministers who really were going in problematic directions once they encountered learning mm. uh, and so it really takes a unique person to kind of navigate that tension and come out orthodox uh orthodox and modern i mean that's mm. that's really the 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 sort of the sort of synthesis it seems that you get in somebody like bovink and it, and it reminds me i mean one thing that i i find interesting about the recovery of sort of the one bovink model uh and maybe you could respond to this um it could be easy, I think, for people to think that because we're not doing two, but maybe we don't do two bovinks anymore. The one bovink is the bovink I want him to be st now. Mm. Uh, but yes, but indeed. but but the recovery of the one bovink is also the recovery of a bovink who's still a little weird, uh, mm. <laughs> like he's still correcting you in some way. It's not the recovery of just a particularly yes. smart confessionalist. The one mm. bovink is a. a has a more cosmopolitan and uh, mm -hmm. he's he's unique in a, in a in a certain sort of way. His unity even uh, mm -hmm. is a kind of unique project, and so I think Dale was right. There was there's something about reading Bovink, and really I just remember again reading his his dogmatics for the first time. Uh, uh, it, it felt like I was reading a dogmatician who knew the kinds of questions that I had floating around in my head just because I'm exposed, you know, to to modernity. Actually, that can turn into a question. Um, uh, 
uh, uh, I was going to ask you about the reform dogmatics on precisely this question. Uh, obviously, the, the dogmatics, you know, for all that Bob Inc. has written in, in his writing, uh, uh, is sort of his magnum opus, it, it would seem. Um, but we're, but we're re reading the mature edition, I think, in English of the dogmatics. We're reading all the, the kind of revised edition of the dogmatics. But of course, Bob Inc. wrote the dogmatics in a, in a less mature edition first. Uh, can you tell us what the what the difference is in terms of the the focus and scope of context between those those yeah. two editions and perhaps what that tells us about his project that might help us see what his his one project is? Yeah, that's a an excellent question, um, and it's something that really does merit uh, either a PhD thesis or a, a monograph. Uh, mm. Someone should sit down and compare the the first edition and then the, the revised edition. And, and really plot meticulously all of the points that change and try and account for why that would be a, for me anyway it would be a fascinating fascinating project to read um so as you say he wrote the first edition and then revised it into another edition in two quite different phases of his life so he spent um a couple of decades in the, well the 1880s and 90s as a professor in a small seminary um in a small town in Campen, so his denomination seminary, and, um, and then he moved after that to Amsterdam to work at the Free University of Amsterdam. So still a numerically small setting. You know, it's, it's a big university now with thirty thousand students. But when Bavink went there, you know, it met in kind of a large old townhouse. You know, that had been refurbished into a university building, but um, but an interdisciplinary environment. So. Um, all of a sudden he had the chance to rub shoulders every day in the staff room with people who actually worked in all of these different disciplines he was interested in engaging with. Whereas when he wrote the first edition in Campen, uh, it's very much in a you know, sealed theological environment with people who do what you could obviously see as theology all around him every day. Um, so he writes in a different phase of his life where he um, is, well, I guess, you know, when I think of the way that I've tried to read him over the years, I found it funny to talk about this now, but so much of my early work on Bavink was pushing back against talking about two Bavinks and saying we should only talk about one. But now I'm trying to repopulate a different two Bavinks reading, yeah. which is to talk about a young Bavink and a mature Bavink. Okay? Right. So the young Bavink is in Campen, as I was saying. In the 19th century and inhabiting the late 19th century um, in a really interesting phase of you know, Dutch cultural history around him and social history and intellectual life. But that all changes really dramatically and very quickly as that decade comes to a close. And I think that's part of what forces him to change, as well as the fact that he's in a new intellectual environment. Um, so the so what we find is in the second edition, um, he adds about 700 pages of content to the four mm. volumes. So if you think about the four original volumes, it's the equivalent to write, adding a fifth volume, just in terms of sheer, uh, you know, word count. Um, and there are actually lots of different factors that prompt that. So part of it is that the world around him changes rapidly and quite profoundly um, through the death of Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, which mm. prompts the mass popularity of a new kind of atheism. So in the 1880s and 90s, um, atheism was a factor around him, but um, it was a kind of um, atheism that said, you know, we actually smooth out some of the awkwardness of life in the modern world by taking God out of the picture, and then everything else stays as it is, but is now more comfortable to inhabit. So a kind of um, David Friedrich Strauss kind of approach to atheism. Mm. That we should all just be honest and admit that we're no longer Christians and that we don't think God exists. And then the world that we currently live in will be a more honest, thing to inhabit mm. in modern civilized you know, Western European culture. Um, but the idea is, you know, we remove God, but the moral framework that we have for living in the world stays basically the same. Um, mm. The main change that happens is an absence, the absence of God, um, but life remains very recognizable. So it was a very moralistic kind of atheism that Bavink was you know, engaging with a bit around himself. Um, but um, that kind of atheism really petered out in the 1890s as he's finishing the first edition of the dogmatics mm. and um, so lots of these high-profile Dutch scientist atheists move back to some kind of theism uh, 
and at the same time, um, Bavinck is part of a Calvinist movement that sees it, well, that saw itself in that period as um, saving the future of the Netherlands by um, Christianizing it again in a new way that would be really fit for the modern world. And things are all moving in this direction. They're, you know, founding all these social institutions, newspapers, a university, mm -hmm. a political party, and winning democratic support as well, increasingly. And then 1901, Abraham Kuyper, his colleague in this political party, becomes prime minister. And it looks like all the things they've been dreaming of and working towards for a few decades are all coming true. But then at the same time, uh, Nietzsche, this uh, German atheist, dies, and he'd been really obscure in his lifetime in the Netherlands. People didn't care about him that much at all. Um, but Nietzsche, I mean, you guys know this, you know, but just for listeners who maybe don't know Nietzsche, um, he has a very novel kind of atheism, which says that if we take God out of the picture, the picture can't possibly stay the same. Like, it doesn't have any right to stay the same. We have mm. to revalue all values. Um, so you can't just lazily carry over the same moral imagination or treat any of the same moral uh, claims as given if God is gone, and in Nietzsche's language, because we have killed him. So that changes everything, and that's a completely new kind of atheism. And it sends the world into uncharted territory, because with the Nietzschean experiment, you just don't know where it will end up. And Nietzsche himself was fearful about people who would run with his ideas, because he couldn't see where this would end up either. Um, mm -hmm. So Nietzsche becomes wildly popular, or um, and you can actually see this demonstrably in references to Nietzsche in Dutch literature before and after he dies. Um, while mm -hmm. he's still alive, there's, there's just hardly anything. And then mm -hmm. in the early 1900s, the, the number of references to Nietzsche just rockets up and you have Dutch novelists writing Nietzsche novels that become quite popular. So that yeah. all changes around him. So the field of science has changed in terms of the natural sciences and their relationship to atheism. Atheism has become a completely new thing. Um, the kind of Calvinist movement that, that he was working towards looks like it's finally reached what they were working towards with a neo-Calvinist prime minister in Abraham Kuyper, but he only serves one term and it doesn't go that well. Um, and so he, you know, by 1905, Kuyper is out and um, the the Dutch nation that Bavinck thought was going to embrace Calvinism in some kind of majority form um, just doesn't develop like that and actually the nation becomes much more um content with de-christianization or with some kind of i guess what we could call a postmodern chaos and charles taylor's mm. kind of way of thinking so the world becomes such a different place really quickly um so uh, and um there are all kinds of factors like that with just new ideas and the, the, the lay of the land intellectually changed so much um, and society changed so much the kind of questions it was asking changed so much um, so Bavinck has to revise um, his dogmatics. He thought that dogmatics had to be written in every generation to meet the great questions of the day. The questions of the day had changed pretty fundamentally. Mm. So there's, that's one way you could look at all of it. Um, I think another layer to this um, is also, and this isn't in the biography, but it's something that I've been working on, and it actually just came out in um, the Oxford Handbook of the Reception of Aquinas, um, which came mm. out very recently, so edited by uh, Matthew Levering and Marcus Plested. So I wrote a chapter in there that's on the place of, so this is kind of sidetracking, but I'll bring it back into Bavinck and yeah. why he revises the dogmatics, I think. So in that chapter, it's on how, how Abraham Kuyper used Thomas Aquinas in Kuyper's own intended magnum opus, which was his massive three volume encyclopedia of sacred theology. And um, in a nutshell, the chapter that I have in that handbook on Aquinas is that Kuyper thought that there were two distinct kinds of genius in the history of Christianity, you know, Christian theology. And the analogy that he uses to describe these two distinct kinds of genius is um, the kind of genius that you have if you are a gold digger, um, not in the, you know, looking to marry for money sense, but yeah. <laughs> actually in a mine looking for gold. And if you are a goldsmith, um, so the gold digger has a particular kind of genius, and it's a genius of perception. And that is someone who can spot an insight that no one else has before. You know, so someone who goes into a dark mine and they can see just this, you know, little mm. shine of a bit of gold somewhere in a dark, you know, rock face. And that's a distinct kind of genius, you know, that your eye can perceive. You have this insight, but the particular skill that you have is that you take this chunk of gold up to the surface and you present it to others, and nobody has seen this before. Um, but that person, the gold 
Digger has the genius of perception, but they don't have the genius of mastering the thing that they have perceived. So you need a different kind of genius, and that's where the goldsmith comes in. So the goldsmith is able to take this raw nugget of something remarkable and beautiful and hitherto unseen, and the goldsmith can smelt it and then can craft it and make it something spectacular and ornate. So for Kuiper, in his history of Christian theology, um, the greatest genius of perception was um, Augustine and that what Augustine perceives about God and God's grace, but particularly the knowledge of God, that when we think about God and when we talk about God, we're actually pursuing a distinct avenue of inquiry. It's a distinct line of thought about a distinct subject. Mm -hmm. So Augustine calls that Christian doctrine. So just in having the insight to see that that is its own thing, that we do God talk on particular terms, and the God mm -hmm. talk sets the terms about God and how we talk about God, That that's for Kuiper, that's finding, you know, it's going down into a deep mine and finding a, a spectacular chunk of gold and taking it up to the surface. Mm. But Kuiper said the, the greatest genius in the history of the church, the genius of mastering the thing perceived, so the greatest goldsmith was Thomas Aquinas, because he took Augustine's insight about, about how when we think about God and talk about God, that's Christian doctrine. Um, Aquinas then smelts that and then he crafts it into something spectacular in the Summa. So, um, that's this kind of pattern of two distinct kinds of genius that Kuiper believes in. And when you read that and you realize that throughout he's talking about Aquinas like this and Augustine like that, you then have to ask what kind of, because Kuiper believed he was a genius too, <laughs> what kind of genius <laughs> did Kuiper believe he was? And my argument is that he believed he was a genius of perception, that he had seen something about Christian thought, Christian or Christianity and Christian theology that no one had seen before. Um, and he's now looking for a goldsmith to craft that into something spectacular. And the insight that Kuiper thought he had, that nobody had had before, was that the conditions of the modern world um, had challenged Christianity and Christian theology to justify its own existence on every terrain in a way that it had not uh, yes. before. I mean, maybe, you know, if you go back to, you know, mm. pre-Constantine or something like that, you know, Augustine in the city of God, maybe, you know, you're having to defend the validity of the entire thing before a pagan onslaught. But it's really the Enlightenment that says, we don't need any of this. Um, let's jettison the whole thing. So you have to then, or theology is challenged then with defending itself. Mm. Um, and so Kuiper thought that, that that then sets the scene for Christianity's next great leap forward and a quantum leap, that it will become something greater than it has ever been before, which is um, that in the modern world, you know, a pluralistic society um, where people are thinking independently of the Christian faith about all kinds of things, the Christian faith nonetheless can apply itself to all of these different aspects of society or avenues of inquiry, and it can repopulate them and it can Christianize them and then push them further forward. So then the Christian faith um, purely on the basis of its own ability to kind of validate itself and its own existence can burst forward in the modern mm. age in a form greater than it has ever existed in before. Okay, yeah. so that's, Kuiper thought that that, that, and that's the kind of Kuiperian project, right? That in a world where yeah. no one is forcing you to be a Christian um, and where you're not forcing others to either in this kind of democratic, liberal democratic, modern social uh, setting, that Christianity, that's the stage for Christianity to become um, to kind of progress further um, yeah. in freedom to develop this glorious articulation of the Catholic Christian faith, the faith for all yeah. of life. And yeah. even in the face of the, you know, the challenges of the Enlightenment, it doesn't kind of shrink and, and wither and die. In fact, it blooms and it becomes, you know, a flower greater and bigger and brighter than has ever been before. So he thought that that was his insight. And he thought that he was a genius of perception. But my argument in that chapter is that he's looking for his own Thomas Aquinas. He's looking for a goldsmith, someone who will craft his insight in the encyclopedia and turn it into something like a, a neo-Calvinist, modern mm -hmm. Calvinist summa. And I think that that is also what the Reform Dogmatics is, particularly in the second edition. So Kuiper released his um, encyclopedia in 1894. So just before Bavinck releases volume one of the first edition of his um of his dogmatics and um 
you know, Bavink's already engaged in that writing process, but he needs time to listen to this call and then also to be a critical reader of Kuiper's work. And Kuiper's work, you know, is 1700 pages, it's in three volumes. It's quite a substantial piece of work. It was based on 14 years of lectures. Um, so what you find actually in those years is in Bavink's, um, you know, Bavink writes out his own notes on how to do encyclopedia and it's different to Kuiper's in some points. So he's trying to critically rework Kuiper's mm -hmm. own instincts about how to organize knowledge. And you find him in his lectures speaking appreciatively but critically of Kuiper's ideas as well. Um, and I think you just see this pattern of him in life that he is yeah. that he is Kuiper's mediator to yeah. the rest of the world. Trying to correct some eccentricities. Um, but I think in the dogmatics, he is actually trying to be some kind of you know, Aquinas to Kuiper's um, Augustine. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting in the two editions. Uh, uh, I wonder if one, and you could tell me because you you know the two editions better. But one of the things that um, uh, uh, I gather from the book is that the the first edition is particularly focused in an ecclesiastical context. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the things that's happening in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century is just this is the the kind of flowering of a global era of an era of transportation. You know, Kuiper is mm. a well-traveled man. Bovink yeah. goes to America. He goes to, to the yeah. UK and you're, and it's, it's the era of, and you see this in Bovink's own bibliography. It's the era where we begin to study other religions in a more intimate way. Cause the texts are more available. We're actually meeting a Hindu now because, you know, you might meet one as opposed to that just being an abstraction. And so one of the things that's fascinating to me in the, in, in the edition of the dogmatics I've read, which is the, is the later edition, is that Bavink seems to have this kind of eyeball on, the, maybe I could put it this way. He seems to treat dogmatics, and this is, this is where it's um, very different from, I think, anything I've read. He seems to treat dogmatics as an intellectual project precisely for sort of modern global man. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's writing as though uh, eventually, it's it's almost as though there's something something in him that's itching that says eventually we're going to have to deal with Hinduism and Buddhism and mythology and sort of all of these and Islam even, <laughs> you know, all of these forces with their own traditions and own rich kind of kind of kind of linguistic apparatuses, however you say that. Um, and he's and he's making this kind of big thick first gesture in the dogmatics to sort of say here is how this doctrine is going to be most analogous in these other systems and where we would differ and in some ways uh, be able to work with it. You know, hey, there's a nascent insight there. Here's how Christianity fulfills that. And, and I, I, I gather that, that as, he, as he grew as well, or as he, as he matured, he became, uh, uh, and I haven't seen any, any, you'd know if there's any academic work on this. I gather that he became fascinated with global Christian mission as well. Uh, uh, because this is this is sort of where and almost I, I don't want to overly um, the Rudyard Kipling this, but there's almost a there's there's, there's a, 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 a a dialogue of civilizations almost uh, mm. a, a, as well as a dialogue of the gospel, and of course that can be conflated in a very problematic way. Mm. Uh, but it, is that a fair reading? It, it, is that is that in in the second volume is his scope sort of. Uh, or excuse me, in the second edition is his scope sort of becoming, this is a project just for human beings. Like this is a public intellectual project that has kind of significance for the whole human race. Uh, and he's crafting something uh, that um, uh, 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 helps us, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know, bring that project to fruition. Hmm. It's a great question. Um, I would find that a little bit difficult to answer um in terms of you know does he have any civilizational um ambition for the reform dogmatics um simply because in so i mean when world war one breaks out you know he still has a decade or so left to live and um that really shatters um his well not so much shatters his spirit in terms of Christianity itself, but in terms of Christendom and civilization. Mm -hmm. So he saw these countries that had been formed in his previous <laughs> way of thinking by Christianity, and yet they have now become so utterly estranged from it 
that they go to war with each other and millions of lives are lost um, and Christianity seems to have no restraining power on their imaginations anymore and you know he has ways of of explaining this in terms of i mean for him it's really that that darwin and nietzsche um right. kind of create this chaos spawn together and they transform geopolitics and european cultures um but from then on i think his his perspective forward into the 20th century and in terms of global civilization was a pretty bleak one. I mean, he didn't have any kind of rosy, optimistic, chipper view of the 20th century and how things were yeah. going to go. Um, he really looked into the coming decades with trepidation that the 20th century would be a pretty awful one and that the First World War would not be the last and that the Kaiser would not be the last, um, you know, bloodthirsty monarch who, you know, pursues domination at all costs. Um, and... I mean, he, he didn't claim any kind of prophetic gifting or charismatic ability right. as far as, sure. as I've discovered. But um, the things he writes about the 20th century are a kind of sketching of a Hitler figure um, who mm. will utterly despise the weak and uh, those who are different mm. from himself and yes. who will pursue his individual might over the world at any cost in terms of lives lost. Um, so he his view of civilization becomes quite a troubled one. And yeah. uh, he does become very aware in those later years of a global class of a clash of civilizations um, between East and West, um, but, and, um, but, you know, between Islam and Christianity, and he's troubled by all of these things. And, um, but he, at the same time, he's also, he's quite um, modest about his own achievement um, in terms of the dogmatics. And I think that the dogmatics are a staggering achievement and it's no surprise that yeah. we still read them clarify, they're translated, but... Oh, sorry, I, I should yeah. clarify. I didn't mean to suggest that the that he would have thought that dogmatics was directly accomplishing this mm. as much as indirectly. In other words, we're li Christians. I mean, the, the immediate readers of this are of course just gonna be the church. But the idea, it seems to me, is that Christians are going to have to be thinking about how your faith relates to all of these forces that we see on the horizon that we've never had to deal with in oh, that, yeah. in that yeah, intimate so, way. And so it's okay. a relevant project for, uh, but, he, but he's what he's trying to set up, it seemed to me, was not just a, um, typically when we, we, you know, to this day, when we write sort of how to deal with other religions books, it yeah. typically is, here's a description of their beliefs and why ours are different and better. You know, that's sort mm -hmm. of the thing. But Bovink is almost going to pains in the dogmatics, it seems to me, to say, here's where they're coming from, uh, mm -hmm. and here's actually what's good about them, uh, yeah. and what you can actually work with. And so he's sort of trying to prepare you to have a, a wise yeah. encounter with as many of the forces he's aware of as he can, mm -hmm. it seems to me, which is, of course, um, the beginning yeah. of a much longer project, because, of course, yeah. understanding Islam, for instance, is, you know, there's a whole century of work, you know, now yeah. after yeah yeah oh no so yeah i would answer that that sorry i i guess i just misunderstood your question in the first place but the as i understand it now yeah absolutely i would affirm that as the significance that he thought his work had to his day i mean he he called it publicly in a newspaper the dogmatics needed by our age yeah. and um i think that's actually a very significant way for him to describe the second mm -hmm. edition of the dogmatics not the dogmatics needed by our church but actually the age itself, this epoch, the modern age, which is so fragmented and utterly chaotic in, in all these different claims to truth, uh, whether we can know God or know about God, um, whether life is utterly incoherent, um, whether you know, the kind of uh, the hyper specialization that's occurring in all these different directions of specialization and knowledge whether any of those things have anything to do with each other um yeah. so the age that he lived in was a really he thought he thought it was just a troubled one the, the modern self was mm -hmm. so fragmented and um, the age itself needed uh, a work in christian dogmatics um mm -hmm. that gave mm -hmm. a new articulation of the beating heart of the christian faith as a catholic faith whose catholicity is the thing that um that kind of binds things together um, that otherwise would be very fragmented, you know, it, it yeah. prevents um, or, or it, it's a reconciling force, you know, that's a kind of very classically Bavinkian way of ending any particular piece of writing that if you don't have Christianity, things fall apart 
a big right. drift mm-hmm. apart. But if you do, um, the Christianity actually pulls them back together. Um, so he, and when he says that this is the dogmatics needed by our age, I think that he is actually talking about the age and not just um, for you know for the church. So there there is some kind of ripple effect that he mm. thinks that this could have in his own age. Yeah, very much so. Um, but you know, you know what's what's interesting with this as well is that although we have the second edition, he actually did carry on revising that. It's just that he never finished a third edition. Yeah. Um, so in his own copy of his the second edition dogmatics, he has lots of notes and questions, things that he wants to change, and some of those are very significant. Uh, revi- uh, changing um, what he has written about the doctrine of the Trinity, and you know you err with caution and. and writing about the trinity or um that geology has developed for another decade so we have to keep on developing our account of the doctrine of creation in the light of that and in dialogue with that so he keeps on developing it but the circumstances of the the first world war just mean that he doesn't have the opportunity to focus Mm. all of his attention on this and in some ways that's the most reformed approach to the christian religion is that is recognizing that Um, as you know, God's providence takes humanity into different epochs of history. Uh, the Christian religion has something to say as we apply it to our context. We're just talking about contextualizing our theology to meet the demands of the modern age, and He was very good at that. You you mentioned um, something uh, that you said was uh, He became less optimistic about Christendom um, as World War One sort of sets in and humanity's fragmented. Um, I think that you mentioned this in the book, he starts to move towards, at least in his political outlook, a focus on a Calvin, you know, Calvinism. Uh, so the full expression of Christianity as defined by Cal, a Calvinistic scheme. And he, he starts to become more Louisian uh, and Lewis would follow him not long after he passes away in a sort of mere Christianity approach to the Christian religion, as far as Christendom, like moving Christendom further um, along. Uh, do you think that that's, if Bavink were to last another 100 years, right? Uh, do you think that he would become more open towards, you know, abandoning the project of how having an explicitly Calvinistic Christianity that rules, that governs the, the Netherlands? Um, or do you think that he would move in a more sort of like, here's the Apostles' Creed, Nicaea, Chalcedon. If you guys believe that, we're good to go. Um, or do you think that he would maintain a rigid sort of, uh, you know, a rigid sort of Calvinistic, um, hmm. yeah, system? Yeah. So a hard question to answer wearing my historian's hat, obviously, sure. to speculate sure. what we someone who died would hat. have done. Yes, yeah, yeah, we want the prophet hat. We want the prophet hat, yeah. Um, I mean, things that we can say concretely from what he said and did while he was alive. Um, he was committed to um, liberal democracy. So, you know, the majority doesn't want to be governed by a Calvinist party they won't vote for that party and that party doesn't have a right to govern so um you know and and he said that the age of um of having an established church for example has passed and that won't come back and he said calvinists shouldn't want to bring that back you know so he is committed to the modern social um liberal democratic experiment that he was born into as well um so he wouldn't give up on on liberal democracy i think um and for him, again, that's just a fruit of Calvinism, actually, is that you get liberal democratic society. Um, that's just a historic factor. Um, so affirming liberal democracy for him is affirming Calvinism, even if the liberal hmm. democracy itself isn't um, tremendously favorable towards Calvinists. You know, if you, if you don't get a Calvinist majority voting for your Calvinist political party, and even if you do have a Calvinist political party, you, you know, you, you're... Um, you know, you are, it's not a kind of theocratic party. I think it's a common sure. misconception of what was happening in this period right. historically. Um, so, you know, so they saw themselves as as a, as a party that was there to make sure that the freedoms that they enjoyed and needed in order to live out their Calvinism were the same freedoms that the Dutch Catholics would have to live out their Catholicism. And then the third pillar of society, as it was known, the socialist pillar, which is a kind of catch-all group for everyone who doesn't fit into the the Calvinists or the Catholics. Right. They all 
the same freedoms to live out their beliefs and to live in line with their own consciences. Um, so he wouldn't give up on that. Um, but I think you know something I tried to show in the biography is that um, although in his in his mature phase, um, although he does write a lot about Christianity in a way that he hadn't in you know the young Bavink years, the decades in Campen, um, he doesn't give all of this attention to Christianity because he has given up on Calvinism. And there I was actually trying to correct an impression from his first biographer, um, Valentine Hepp, who argued just that. So his biography includes, you know, that people were rumoring that Bavink was writing about Christianity all of a sudden because he no longer believed in reformed theology and instead he'd become some kind of generic Christian. But actually what I think you see when you look at the balance of things that he releases um, for every book that has Christianity in its title, you also have another one that comes out that's very much about Calvinism. And he goes on writing about Calvinism, defending it right until the very end of his life. So he doesn't give up on it. But I think the change is Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, so if you look at the decades before Nietzsche dies and becomes so popular in the Netherlands, um, the debates are very much intra um, theological debates between yep. rival schools of thought because you have all these different schools of thought mm -hmm. uh, theologically they're all jostling to be the future of christianity in the modern age and they have very different analyses of modernity they have different solutions for the way forward for christianity and um the bavink school the neo-calvinists or the kyperians that's one of those groups that's jostling for um you know the the lead position and plotting the path forward for christianity in the modern netherlands um but then when the Nietzscheans come along, they have absolutely no interest in any of these groups, whether it's, you know, the, the liberal Protestants who are very material, kind of materialist, whether it's um, the kind of like the ethical theologians who are somewhere between Schleiermacher before them and Bart coming after, um, mm. you know, whether it's the, the kind of remonstrants, uh, the Mennonites, um, the, the free evangelicals, the Nietzscheans do not care. And they don't have a kind of selective vision of, you know, well, we like the more liberal Christians, but we really dislike the, the orthodox ones. In fact, the Nietzscheans think that Jesus has hoodwinked all of Western civilization. So mm. we need to see Jesus as the root of the tree and the branches that grow from her are all equally undesirable. And we are going to take an ax and hack away at the mm. root so that the whole tree falls down. And if before that, if you're the young Herman Bavink, and you invest so much of your time and energy in defending Calvinism over against other ways of articulating Christianity in the modern age. Um, and you just go on with those battles and you don't see that actually, you know, these are branches that are kind of entangled with each other and they're fighting with each other, you know, for um, for dominance. But then at the bottom of the tree, someone's about to chop you all down at once. Um, yeah. Then the battle's up high and the branches won't really be for anything because the tree is about to fall. So you have to um, interact with the Nietzschean attack on Christ at the core and the heart of Western civilization. And Christ as, I mean, Bavink felt the essence of all forms of Christianity. So for Bavink, I mean, he wrote a book called, called Christianity, um, at Christendom, where he tries to argue for an essence of Christianity. So something that all of these different mm, yeah. forms of understanding Christianity have in common. And it's it's an astonishingly broad array of church traditions and thinkers and lots of really heterodox liberal modern Protestants as well. Um, you know, Schleiermacher, Ritschel, you know, so higher critical German types. Um, but he says they do all have one thing in common, which is that they all reflect in one way or another on Jesus. And they may think radically different things about Jesus and say very different things about him. And the thing that develops in response to the reflection on Jesus might be incredibly different, but Jesus is the common factor. And um, so he said that, you know, that, that um, if in this book, if we get rid of Jesus, all of these different um, um, kind of, well, he said that they are like phenomena of christianity manifestations of it right but the phenomena are expressions of the essence of the essence is christ himself so he he, he can't just go on in those years you know, devoting a hundred percent of his energy to calvinism and battling against the modern theologians particular dutch school of thought or the ethical theologians another rival school or um 
Roman Catholics, and he has to have something to say to the Nietzscheans and to address the spirit of the age. So I think that's what he's doing in that phase of life, actually, which is a really interesting thing. Yeah, um, that uh, that actually um, uh, brings up a, a, a question I wanted to ask, which is you just mentioned this, uh, the essence of Christianity. I don't think this has been published in English. Has it translated? So there is a kind of translation of it, um, but it's it's a very loose paraphrase. Um, so we need a better one. Okay, what is um, what are uh, one of the things that your biography does that's just so so fun uh, is you 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 for if you're a, a sort of bobbing fan you you see all these books that he wrote uh, uh, a lot uh, throughout his life and each time of course you're thinking like wow I hope that's in English and a right. bunch of them aren't right. uh, and so there's uh, I guess there's this I think you said a 200 page book or something like this on raising teenagers uh, yeah. <laughs> you yes. know, uh, and it's a it's a fascinating book I mean I, I I started trying to translate that last year and then the pandemic happened and so that's on that's on my longer term oh, list of interesting. So, I want to get it out before my kids are teenagers. <laughs> yes. The, well, the I, it was Joe and I. He, wrote a, he yeah. wrote a smaller because he he writes the Reformed dogmatics and then he yeah. writes um, Reasonable Faith or Wonderful Works of God, yeah. uh, but but apparently he wrote this sort of you know down the Platonic chain of being. There's an even sort yeah. of more condensed book. Is that is there any plans for that one to? So, yeah, so fantastic news to report, which is that that is in the process of publication. Uh, so oh. one of my former PhD students, um, Cam Clossing, who now teaches at um, Christ College in Sydney in Australia, and one of my current PhD students, Greg Parker, have translated it. Uh, so oh. they delivered the manuscript to Hendrickson, the publisher, uh, two days ago, I think. So, so oh. that's great news. So that's coming out. So. Well, perfect right. timing. I mean, <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. One of, but it's basically the dogmatics or wonderful works distilled even more for I mean, teenagers in effect. So, yeah, um, you know, older high school students or first year university students. So. This is very good news. Yeah. 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 You Go know, ahead. one thing um, I'm also interested in is uh, and maybe maybe you you've read enough sort of secondary source material or or maybe even some primary source stuff on um, because I, a big concern for me is in education. Um, mm. What were the relation? What do you think uh, Boving's what was the relationship that he held? I know you mentioned some of this in the book between the state and uh, education. He did think that uh, there would there should have been a state funded um, sort of arm that was giving money to uh, to um, educational institutions. And today, I think a lot of the uh, people, at least in America, in the reform circles, they're repelled by that notion. And I. I understand why, um, because we're, we're watching the entanglement of the state and the education system mm -hmm. just produce very bad worldviews uh, because Christ is sort of removed completely. But I'm curious, um, what, what was the why was he so concerned that everybody because everybody was not entitled to an education uh, in, you know, in the previous uh, centuries? Yeah education was for the privileged. It was only for a certain class of people. And in the modern age, we think that education is a right. And so everybody must have access to education. Was Bovink sort of moving that way because he saw it was necessary for the advancement of Christendom that the, uh, that the society should be educated, at least literate and be able to read and write and do arithmetic? Or was it basically on, uh, was his uh, motivation more on a human rights level? So, uh, you know, was it because he thought that education would contribute to the flourishing of Christendom and therefore the state should um, uh, financially support it and create yeah. laws around it? Or was it to, you know, because yeah. he thought this was a fundamental human right? Mm -hmm. I think so. The reasons for that are manifold and also complex. Um, he did think that that. We use the word science. Well, I use the word science yeah. in the book in the Dutch sense. So not the natural sciences in a restrictive way, but actually learning, you know, scientia, um, not or knowing. And um, for Bavink, the approach to knowing, the priority of knowing across 
the broad sweep of Western culture is profoundly shaped by Christianity in the first place. So Christianity is the soil in which education in the West has, has, has grown from that soil in the first place. Um, and then by the time we find Bavinck as a, you know, as a young man or as a teenager, as a child, he does enjoy a very privileged existence and that he goes to some very good schools. And that was certainly not the case for most Dutch kids. But we also find him coming of age in a time when the second industrial revolution is just part and parcel of the creation of a new middle class. So yeah. as, um, educational aspirations are growing anyway. And the Dutch government itself is trying to um, populate an education system where far more people um, get an education. Um, the world is moving into a knowledge based economy and it's not in the national interest to have an, a largely illiterate population. So there's this mass drive towards education anyway. Um, and he also came from a church tradition that was accustomed to running its own schools originally because they, so their denomination was formed in 1834, and that was a period in Dutch history um, before liberal democracy had begun. So it's a country that is ruled at that point by an authoritarian monarch who has a very particular set of designs on the religious life of the population. Um, so he was very Kantian. Um, the point mm. of religion isn't anything supernatural or metaphysical. Sure. The point of religion is morality. So if we can harness the power of religion, um, then we can produce a really excellent moral population and then the, the Netherlands will flourish that way. So the king very much tried to control that through the government and um, control the teaching of you know, religion in schools and also uh, really limited um, the freedom of religion for people who didn't want to be part of his religious program. So Bavink's family came from a denomination that had seceded from mm -hmm. the Dutch Reformed Church um, in that context. And um, we're, as part of that clandestine existence, an effort for freedom and to try and make sure that their kids were cat were kind of catechized in an alternative way to what they would get in state schools, they then start running underground schools to go along with their underground churches. Mm. So it's kind of a battle for the souls of their children. Mm. So his church tradition just has this as part of its makeup originally, this idea that um, sometimes you need a Christian school that forms your child differently to the way that they would be formed if the state provided that formation. Um, so those schools were illegal. They were generally of a pretty low quality educationally just because they had so few resources and they were run, um, you know, and um, certainly without the kind of resources you would get at a better state school anyway. Um, and you know, I guess part of this whole culture as well is, you know, if you're this persecuted church, how will you train up leaders if the whole education system goes against the whole rationale of the denomination so they they need their own schools um and um but by the time bavink is born the country has become a liberal democracy and parents from his denomination do have more freedom to send their kids to school and to have higher social ambitions um and uh, so the question is then, you know, what kind of school do we want for our child? Um, do mm. we want them to go to a school that aligns with our denomination, um, just a generic state school? Um, so all those questions are really live ones in their denomination. And what it produces eventually is people as a denomination that says we believe in liberal democracy. We participate in it. We pay our taxes like everyone else. Um, but we also have a distinct set of beliefs. We have our own Christian worldview. Um, we have distinct views on the Bible and education. So we want the government to, to pay for schools that align with our expressions of you know who we are and what we believe in liberal democracy in the same way that the state funds um, schools that have a different worldview uh, to our own. Um, so the state should fund them both equally. So what you find actually is just a lot of philosophical debate in the background about um, whether one worldview is just common sense for everyone or whether actually all worldviews are kind of arbitrary or rest on a lot of unprovable assumptions and yes. um, you know whether the state is is bound to or whether the state is fair if it acts in such a way that it only privileges one set of a priori assumptions over against any other. So Bavink spends a lot of his life um, campaigning for 
these Christian schools that have grown up in the history of his church to be funded by the state. And then eventually they win and the state in 1917 agrees that it will fund um, schools uh, regardless of the, the worldview commitment that the school is, is run along the lines of. And that is actually still the case in the Netherlands today. <laughs> oh, um, so Bavink and Kuiper were the architects of the modern Dutch education system. So the last time I was in the Netherlands, I was staying with a really good friend of mine in Amsterdam. He's a minister there, um, Marinus de Jong, um, who helped out a lot with checking my translations for things in the book. And um, just next to his house, he's a pastor in Amsterdam in a reformed church. Next to his house is a Hindu school. Uh, and it's a state-funded Hindu school. Uh, I mean, in the UK, that would be just inconceivable. That would blow people's minds. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you can have a reformed school um, that's funded by the state. You could have a Hindu school. You could have a Muslim school. You could have an explicitly uh, atheist school. Um, so the, that kind of freedom of conscience um, extends in, in pretty much every direction. And the role of the state, as that's envisioned, is... Um, not to, to kind of boss you and telling you what you should think rather it expects you to yeah. exercise a lot of agency and intentionality about who you are what you contribute sure. to society um how you view the world what kind of parent you're trying to be and how you raise your child and then the role of the state is to facilitate that yeah that's really fascinating um well this has been great uh maybe we'll just ask one last kind of uh uh, uh go out question um and I, i'm interested in this because um one of the th we we did a, a podcast a couple of weeks ago on the power of biography, and you know one of the things is that a human life uh, uh, is its own way of kind of looking at a project, looking at not just what somebody writes, but what their what their if I could put it this way, what their story is. And in fact, one of the things I really appreciated about the biography is uh, how it seems like there, there's a portrayal there of kind of Dutch piety in the late nineteenth mm -hmm. century that looking at their own lives as a narrative seems to have been a kind of popular thing. So you you have uh, Bavink's father writing this kind of autobiography. Mm -hmm. He finds it really significant that there's kind of symmetries mm -hmm. across generations. You know, I, I didn't get this post-it comp and Bavink got the post-it, my son got the post-it comp. And, mm -hmm. and there's this seemingly like this look for symmetry uh, uh, in life, but, uh, uh, but maybe that could be converted into a question, you know, in one way, this book is a narrative, you know, it's telling a story about a person, but what, what for you uh, in your research, what, what discovery about Bavink most surprised you? Uh, what did, if I could put it this way, what would you say you had not quite appreciated about Bavink that, that putting it in narrative form actually helped you sort of see something maybe a little mm. fresh in him? Yeah. Uh, so you could try to answer that on two levels. Um, the first is the big surprise for me was the love story with Amelia Dendecker, um, simply because mm, it's yeah. not in any of the previous biographies and it's so significant to him. So that's and that actually frames the circumstances that allowed him to write the reform dogmatics as a kind of sad, miserable uh, singleton <laughs> right. who didn't want to be single. Um, yeah. So that was a big surprise to find that there are years and years and years of diary entries in Latin about this girl um, he wanted to marry and didn't work out. Um, and I think that the the thing that surprised me when i had to set it all out narratively was um discovering bavink the polymath mm. um so when i first became aware of bavink you know as a seminarian years and years ago um you know i read the dogmatics and thought wow this this person was a great theologian and then you discover oh wow he's written all these works on other topics that you know in my seminarian mind aren't really the things that theologians write about that's very interesting and then you go away and read some secondary literature and then you find the two bavinks approach and this is all just because he just doesn't know who he is or what he wants to do and then i had a sense of in the first book of of th that being wrong and that he does have some way of holding it together but narratively to set that out um it's still a different thing and it was so seeing that that there's an intentionality about his life as a polymath, um, that that was a big surprise to me. So um, there's a, a book that I wish had come out while I was writing the biography, but it only came out very recently. Um, if it had come out while I was writing the biography, I would have interacted with it uh, by Peter Burke. It's called um, Polymath: A History from Leonardo da Vinci to Susan Sontag. It's so just a fascinating history of polymaths, and Bavink isn't in the book, uh, sadly, but um, but you know he, it's it's a very useful book in articulating what I think is happening in Bavink's life. So one of the 
one of the things that that book says about the lives of polymaths is that there are some polymaths who become that because they have an insatiable thirst for novelty so they just can't be hemmed in by any one discipline mm -hmm. or career and they they're like butterflies that go from flower to flower a bit randomly you know but they see another one and it looks beautiful so they land on it and get the nectar and then fly somewhere else but there's a different kind of polymath that has an insatiable thirst for knowledge and new knowledge because they have a sense of how everything fits together and that is the kind of polymath that Bavink was yeah um, and that actually comes from his lifelong exploration of the Catholicity of the Christian faith, mm. That, mm. that it's universal, um, not in the kind of soteriological sense that everyone goes to heaven, but universal as, as a faith that is, you know, every square inch. I mean, that's what attracted him so much to Kuiper at the beginning, uh, but that, that it does um, take root in every culture and every period of history, but also in every human endeavor and every area of human life. So it pursues the redemption of everything. Mm. And it truly is a faith that mm. has, that corresponds really perfectly to the doctrine of creation and createdness, that everything that exists exists because of God. Um, mm. And the kind of, you know, so you get into kind of Thomas and his, um, you know, ontology and everything about making sense of the world. Christianity makes sense of the world for Bavink. Yes. And because of that, he wants to make sense of the world through Christianity. And then that is what drives him to become a polymath, I think, um, because mm. it all fits together. And he really believes that it can. Um, yep. So setting that out narratively was a revelation to me um, about what his life meant and looked like, but also I think about his significance um, as, a, as a thinker and why he needed a new biography that would set out the polymathic Herman Bavink um, because we live in this incredibly fragmented mm. I mean, postmodern chaos right yeah. um, worlds that are that where everything is drifting apart and things are are really falling apart around us in ways that are shocking all the time and um, everything is, is either drifting apart or imploding um, to find a reformed theologian in the midst of that at a slightly earlier phase of that process but who does believe that you can that 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 you can make sense of the world through christianity and he just who has this unique setting and person combination of personality traits and opportunities and dispositions and gifts who can actually try to live that out um mm. and do and do what he did in his life that's really significant because it is so rare yeah um, but we stand to learn so much from it i think about the christian faith Excellent. Well, Dr. Eglinton, thank you so much. This was um, such a good conversation and we appreciate your time and your work. So keep it up. You're doing good. And and we'll look for, a, um, what's, do you know the title of the book that's coming out? The, the manuscript? Um, it's the, I think it's the guide, guidebook for the, of the guidebook for the instruction of the Christian religion. I'm not sure exactly which working title they've gone with in English, but Okay. That would be the translation of the Dutch title. Got but it. But it's coming out with Hendrickson Publishers by Cam Klossing and Greg Parker and Herman Bavink. Yes, we will anticipate that with glee. Um, everyone, thank you for uh, uh, tuning in for another episode of Pilgrim Faith. Uh, head on over to the Davenant Institute's YouTube page. Give this video a like and subscribe and share it everywhere. Everyone should be aware of what uh, Dr. Englington is doing. And uh, everybody should be aware of Herman Bovink and his life and his theology and uh, what he thought about everything. Um, so, uh, brother... Thank you, Joe. Love you, brother. Love you, man. And we will see you all next time. See ya.